you've been listening for the morning so far, uh, I think uh, you already have a list of 25 or so unknowns. Um, and as I was mentioning, my, my big unknown is the non-COVID harms as well. So we're talking a lot about COVID and its uh, routes of transmission and the way different countries have managed it. But very few people seem to be collecting data about uh, the downsides of pandemics in terms of mental health, lost educational opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. That will uh, make itself known eventually, but we need to consider both sides of the equation. Uh, and also to get things in perspective. So I'm delighted uh, now to welcome Mark Honingsbaum, who's a senior lecturer at uh, City University in London and author of quite a few books, but most recently and pertinently with a new edition coming up uh, just out is uh, uh, The Pandemic Century, 100 Years of Panic, Hysteria and Hubris. Uh, so who better to tell us all about Disease X in 15 minutes? Over to you, Mark. Uh, well, thank you very much, Phil, for that lovely introduction. And I really want to thank um, uh, George Davy and Fiona Godley to put, for putting together this terrific conference. Um, so I've already been taking notes. So I had a list of various unknowns, but I think I've got about 20 more just from the morning's um, presentations. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about disease X and other unknowns. Um, and yeah, I welcome your questions afterwards. I'm only going to cover a little bit of the information in my book. Um, so, I mean, ever since uh, the US National Academy of Medicine issued a report on emerging infections in 1992, scientists have been warning that globalization coupled with climate change and the increasing demand for animal protein has made the world intrinsically more vulnerable to infectious diseases, both known and unknown. So the classic example of this is HIV, the retrovirus now known to be the cause of AIDS, but which in 1980, when doctors began seeing and treating the first aged patients, had never been seen to cause disease in humans and was completely unknown to science. Uh, another more recent example, of course, is the coronavirus that sparked the worldwide epidemic of SARS in 2002 to 2003. At that time, coronaviruses were considered the Cinderella's of the viral world. They were responsible, they were known to be responsible for a third of common colds, but rarely caused fatal outcomes. And ambitious young uh, researchers, medical researchers, were advised to steer clear of them. Indeed, um, the history of microbiology is littered with examples of pathogens whose significance was realized far too late. So what I do in my book, uh, The Pandemic Century, essentially is I revisit the stories of nine of these pathogens, um, including um, the Legionnaire's disease outbreak that occurred at the Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia in 1976, and also the Ebola and Zika epidemics in 2014 and 2015 to 16. Uh, and in each case, I show how what was known before the emergence event for instance, that water towers and air conditioning systems, in the case of Legionnaire's disease, don't present a risk to hotel guests. Uh, that Ebola doesn't circulate in West Africa and can't reach a major urban center. Or that Zika is a relatively harmless mosquito-borne disease were shown to be false assumptions. And I explain how in each case, the epidemic sparked much soul searching about known knowns and unknown unknowns, and what scientists and public health experts should do to avoid these epistemological blind spots in the future. So as I'm, um, sorry, uh, just missed out a quick slide here. So this is uh, just to cover my book. Um, so, I mean, as I'm sure you all know, the concept of known knowns and unknown unknowns was famously introduced into public discourse by the US Secretary of State, Donald Rumsfeld, at a Pentagon news conference in 2002. At the time, Rumsfeld's comments were widely lampooned for um, what New York Times called their Alice in Wonderland quality. But as many of Rumsfeld's critics subsequently acknowledged, he was drawing on well-known scholarship in the philosophy of knowledge and the social construction of scientific facts. Indeed, much scientific research, as I'm sure you all know, is based on investigating known unknowns where scientists develop a theory and then design experiments to test the null hypothesis. Um, historians and philosophers of science also routinely apply these ideas 
to capture the uncertainties surrounding natural events from earthquakes to climate change to pandemics that pose a catastrophic threat to modern societies and where knowledge of that threat may be partial or incomplete. However, in addition to the three types of knowledge described by Rumsfeld, we also propose a fourth category, the so-called unknown known. So this captures the situation in which experimenters think they've discovered everything that there is to know about a scientific object, but are unaware of their ignorance as regards certain important aspects of it. Uh, so a, a good example, I think, is Zika. So scientists had known about the Zika virus since 1951, when Alexander Haddo, a Scottish zoologist with an interest in mosquito-borne diseases, isolated the virus uh, in the Zika rainforest in Uganda. Um, so if I can just quickly show you. So this is an image uh, of a steel platform where Haddo conducted his experiments. Um, what he did actually is he put Asian sentinel monkeys on these different platforms and exposed them to mosquitoes at different elevations in the rainforest. Um, so after his studies, uh, the virus was ascertained to produce a mild and uh, self-limiting illness in humans and basically was dismissed as rather uninteresting. That all changed, however, in 2015 when Zika uh, sparked a large outbreaks in northeastern Brazil. These outbreaks were accompanied by disturbing cases of microcephaly in infants, but because so little was known about the virus and its pathology, the relationship with microcephaly and infection during pregnancy was unclear. The result of this was that it took until February 2016 for the World Health Organization to declare Zika an international public health emergency. I think to its credit, following the Zika epidemic, the WHO recognized uh, that these knowledge gaps had major implications for public health. In particular, the question was how should the world prepare for and respond to a potentially ever-changing and ever-shifting list of emerging infectious diseases? Previously, it had listed six diseases on its priority list of pathogens for which the world lacked adequate vaccines and therapeutics. Now, in February 2018, it added a seventh category, disease X. Disease X was meant to be a placeholder. Recognition, as the WHO put it, that, and I'm quoting, a serious uh, international epidemic could be caused by a pathogen currently unknown to cause human disease. But what few people could have anticipated at the time was that just two years later, the world would be witnessing a pandemic caused by just such a pathogen, SARS-CoV-2. Now, I should say at this point that the epistemological status of the coronavirus is the, on, the object of ongoing debate. So genomic analysis has shown that it shares 80% of its genetic code with SARS-1. However, SARS-2 is much more closely related to a bat virus, dubbed RATG13, that was isolated from a horseshoe bat in an abandoned mine shaft in Yunnan in southern China in 2013. So SARS-2 shares 96.2% of its genetic code with RATG13. However, that 3.8% genetic divergence is equivalent to an average of 50 years and at least 20 years of evolutionary change, meaning that some other species of horseshoe bat or possibly a pangolin must have been involved in the virus's transfer to humans. But nor is it known where the virus first spilled over into human populations or how precisely it was conveyed to Wuhan. The earliest recorded case, the so-called patient zero, was a 70-year-old man who fell ill on December 1st at or near a wild animal market in Wuhan. We know that in all, two-thirds of the initial cases had a history of exposure to the market. However, 14 did not, prompting speculation that the virus was already circulating in Wuhan in mid-November or possibly as early as October. Nor 12 months into the pandemic do we know why some people suffer severe COVID illness 
require intubation and a ventilator to support their breathing, while others only experience mild symptoms or none at all. Nor do we know to what extent infection with SARS-CoV-2 confers immunity against subsequent reinfection or how long that immunity might last. Most frustrating of all, the infection fatality rate varies widely from country to country, with some modelers putting it at around 1% and others at closer to, two, at closer to 0.5% or lower. So this has sown much confusion, I think, in the public mind about the extent to which COVID-19 presents a greater risk to us than, say, seasonal flu. Now, following the announce, announcements by Pfizer and Moderna that, Moderna that their vaccines prevented illness in more than 90% of trial participants, we also have a new unknown, which we've all already been alluded to by, I think, Gabriel Lung, Will these vaccines also block transmission of the virus? So the sooner we know the answer to that question, the sooner we will know whether it's safe to permit sporting events and other mass entertainments to resume. Perhaps most concerning of all is the question whether the coronavirus will mutate before the vaccines can be deployed at scale. Viruses are always mutating, of course, but the good news so far is that SARS-CoV-2 appears to be relatively stable for an RNA virus. Unfortunately, scientists are under intense political pressure to offer reassurance to a public wearied by the social distancing measures and fed up with the lockdowns. Little wonder then that some have found a receptive audience for authoritative sounding proposals, such as the Great Barrington Declaration, that appear, I stress appear, to offer, to offer a rational exit strategy from our present predicament. This problem is compounded by politicians who promise to, quote, follow the science, ignoring the fact that scientific hypotheses are always provisional and subject to adjustment whenever new and better evidence comes along. Indeed, I'd argue that if anything has taught us the value of caution and the perils of scientific hubris, it's the long shadow cast by the 1918 to 1919 Spanish influenza pandemic. Since it became possible to retrieve viral genetic material uh, from the H1N1 pandemic virus, virologists have made huge progress in understanding the factors that made the Spanish flu so virulent. By comparing the 1918 virus to descendant strains of H1N1 still in circulation, scientists have also come to a better understanding of its epidemiology and its pathophysiology. However, while it's known that the H1N1 Spanish flu was infectious to all age groups in 1918, scientists are still no closer to solving the riddle of why it proved so deadly to young adults. The reverse of most seasonal flus, which like COVID-19, caused more severe illness and deaths in elderly age ranges. The result is that despite all the advances in microbiology, immunology, vaccinology, and preventive medicine in the century since 1919, influenza researchers are still no closer to being able to predict when new pandemic strains will emerge or how they will impact populations when they do. As Jeffrey Taubenberger and David Morins at the NIH, both leading authorities on the pathology and epidemiology of flu have put it, and I'm quoting, in recent decades, pandemic influenza has continued to produce numerous unanticipated events that expose fundamental gaps in scientific knowledge. These uncertainties make it difficult to predict influenza pandemics and therefore to adequately plan to prevent them. My point is that we should not expect coronaviruses to be any different. Indeed, based on the current rate of scientific discovery, it's estimated there may be as many as 13,000 new coronaviruses still out there waiting to be discovered. The only thing that is certain is that there will be new plagues and new pandemics. It's not a question of if really, but when. So Camus, uh, Albert Camus, uh, the author of Plague, whose epigraph opens my book, was right, I think. Pestilences may be unpredictable, but they will recur. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, um, that's the end of my talk. I welcome your questions. Beautiful timing there. Very impressed uh, with that, 
Mark. I mean, looking at your 100 year perspective, as well as the known unknowns, you're sort of suggesting there are some never knows. The fact that we still don't understand some of the things about the 18 influenza pandemic. Do you think there are things we just will never know? They'll, the evolution well, of the virus will always be ahead of us. Well, I think, I mean, the reason that, the, uh, I'm not, we, one should never say never, of course, but um, uh, the problem with 1918 and, and talking about any influenza epidemics uh, that came before 1918 is that the earliest physical evidence we have actually, you know, virus that's been isolated from um, uh, putative victims of the flu dates from May 1918. So we simply don't have any viral isolates earlier than that. Um, and that one of the epidemics, pandemics that I've always been fascinated with was the so-called Russian flu pandemic that preceded the 1918 flu. Uh, and that may actually hold the solution to this unusual uh, more uh, uh, profile of severe mortality in young adults in 1918. So there are all, so all sorts of lots of all sorts of theories about what type of influenza virus that may have been and whether um, you know elder older age groups who had exposure to it that may explain why they had some um, you know seem to have some uh, cross protection to the 1918 flu. But we just don't know that answer. Um, and I think yes, yeah, it's, it's likely we, we may never know. <laughs> do you have some, I'm not asking you to apologise for the UK government, but do you have some sympathies with politicians? And it's very easy for us to say, oh, politicians are terrible, it's awful. But mm. given that there are so many unknowns when a new pandemic or a disease X strikes, do you, do you think realistically, given the speed of spread, we could have done much in the UK? Because we talked earlier about whether we could have closed our borders in the same way New Zealand did. Yeah. But it's likely given how, you know, the UK has 14 contiguous New Zealands with huge travel routes. Do you think it was impossible for us to have stopped it in that same way because it was probably travelled all the way in here already? Well, yeah, I think it's highly likely. I mean, we, we now know from, um, I think, you know, um, tests of, of sewerage, don't we, that it was probably circulating in Italy and other parts of Europe as, as early as December, if not, not earlier. Um, so, yeah, I think it was, obviously it was very hard to absolutely stop it entering the country. But I think certainly that, you know, um, a more severe bans on international flights could and would have made a difference. So I was struck by that slide showing that although there were lots of introductions, there are only a small number that actually result in, you yes. know, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Virus. I was also slightly depressed by the slide that showed that the people who were hit hardest in the first wave mm. are being hit hardest in the second wave. I was rather hoping that the people who had it hard in the first wave would mm. it would be less severe, but that doesn't seem to be the case either. Uh, just, I, just to answer your, your question again, I, I, one thing I find interesting about New Zealand um, is that there's a very well-known historian of influenza called Geoffrey Rice. Um, and he had been um, campaigning for years for a proper memorial uh, to the 1918 influenza pandemic, which interestingly hit New Zealand very hard, much harder than Australia, that did impose uh, maritime quarantines and delayed the arrival of Interesting. So it wasn't until, um, uh, you know, Ahern uh, came in as prime minister that he had a receptive uh, audience and she immediately agreed to unveil a memorial, which was unveiled in November 2019. Wow. And I can't help think that that made Jacinda her more receptive yeah. to the parallels with what happened 100 years ago. And therefore, yeah. uh, you know, she listened to scientists in perhaps a way that um, British politicians didn't. So I think, you know, obviously what I'm impressed with the way that New Zealand really did um, impose tough restrictions early on and it did make a difference. And, you know, they brought in all the test and trace mm -hmm. stuff that we failed to do. Well, and at the price of restricting their travel and their tourism, you know, Australia and New Zealand are now playing rugby in fairly crowded stadiums with people not wearing masks. It seems like another world on the yeah. opposite yeah. side of the planet. Let's see what questions we have. I think, is, is it Sarah? Who's taken over from Nikki, or is it still Nikki who's fielding questions for us? Uh, Nikki, Nikki's, uh, Nikki's online, but I'm fielding for you today. Oh, hello. Tell, do you have any good questions for us? Yeah, so it's, uh, the Q&A has been really, um, really active from our attendees, so uh, thanks for a great talk, Mark. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that's, that's come through is, is, in your view, what is the uh, solution for these zoonotic diseases that are spreading? What is the solution? Uh, well, I think uh, we, we need we need like a multi prong approach, really. Um, so in the short term, obviously, we have to be much better at, you know, food security. Um, so, I mean, 
coronavirus is thought to have resulted from the wild animal trade or, um, you know, lax biosecurity in and around these caves where we know bats that half the virus live. It's very hard to control because my, my understanding is that um, in Yunnan and uh, other parts of South, uh, Southeast Asia, you have two problems. You really have, you know, farmers who are doing traditional farming will routinely enter these caves uh, to actually collect bat guano to fertilize their fields. Um, and, you know, obviously that creates a risk. So, you know, uh, it's possible that this all started when some farmer or maybe, you know, uh, uh, the son of some farmer uh, went into a cave, got contaminated, and late, later got on a high-speed train to Wuhan, where he was going to continue some studies somewhere. Um, but the more, the bigger issue is really around um, large-scale livestock farming, uh, which we know is a risk for bird flu and other viruses that can very easily get into um, domestic poultry and also pigs and swine. So I think that's really important. But of course, the bigger picture is uh, the, the way that um, we uh, as humans are putting uh, increasing stress and encroaching on these uh, natural habitats, these wild habitats where these viruses reside, uh, you know, both by uh, having human settlements encroaching on the perimeters of rainforests, but also roads, building roads to go into those areas to extract minerals and lumber cutting down large uh, areas of the rainforest there was a big problem in southeastern Guinea that was thought to have displaced the, the bats that normally would be remote from humans and that they took up residence in villages where they came into contact with uh, children. Um, uh, and of course, on top of that, we have the whole issue of climate change. Um, so these, these are multiple factors. Um, you know, I think a lot of the uh, solution comes in changing our farming practices practices and biosecurity. You mentioned there are 13,000 coronaviruses yet to mm. be discovered. Do you think there's a role for virus hunters going out there and trying to discover all 13,000 and sequencing the genomes and trying to prepare mm. vaccines in advance? Or does that seem well, like... Well, no, I mean, I think, I mean, that, that is, that, that's how we, that's how we have this estimate in the first place. I mean, that's an estimate based on, uh, you know, teams like the Eco Health Alliance, um, working with Chinese colleagues, uh, and based on their rate of discovery, they estimate there may be this many more. I mean, obviously, I'm always a little bit skeptical because, um, you know, uh, scientists are always trying to promote the value of their research and get more funding. But I think it's kind of no brainer. Uh, you know, what would we rather do? Spend a few billion on, on, you know, going to the rainforest or tank the global economy to the tune of 16 trillion? Uh, it's probably even more than that now. Okay, let's have another question, Sarah. Um, so obviously, we, there's a lot being talked about around uh, emerging emerging pandemic threats. But what can we learn from from history about recovering as a society from those pandemics? Uh, so yeah, I mean, there are lots of different lessons. Uh, it, it's quite hard to draw. So, uh, so um, strangely, the 1918 flu, I don't think, is a really is a good example. Uh, because, so, I mean, I've written about this extensively, but for the longest time it was known as the forgotten pandemic, because despite its huge uh, impact on morbidity and mortality, it was rather overshadowed by the First World War. Uh, we were all on a wartime footing. Um, there was no attempt really at social distancing. It wasn't possible, the war took priority. And therefore, afterwards, I mean, people didn't really dwell on it. They, you could have lived a night through that whole period of 1918 and not really have been aware that there was this major pandemic going on. Um, and although, you know, the economy took a hit, it very rapidly returned to its uh, pre-existing steady level. I think COVID-19 is completely different. You know, for me, I've been casting back to uh, the plague outbreaks that occurred in the 17th century that saw quite severe quarantines and social distancing measures uh, in, you know, Florence and other cities throughout Italy. Uh, I think we have to look to those examples much more because we're really undergoing um, really an unprecedented social experiment. I mean, never before in the history of medicine have we seen um, lockdowns on the scale, uh, you know, affecting populations on the, the, the level we've seen now. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, of course, people in, in, in the Middle Ages and during, had to learn to live with plague, right? It persisted for many uh, seasons. It came back in subsequent decades. And uh, of course, there was no possibility of vaccines then. People didn't really even know for sure how to transmit it. Uh, and it's 
it's an open question still precisely why it disappeared from Northern Europe. Um, hopefully we know a lot more now and we're armed with vaccines, we'll be able to stop it. Uh, but yeah, I think that the effects of this are gonna play out for many uh, months and years to come. Okay, and another, we've got time for a couple more questions if we have them, Sarah. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of um, discussion been around obviously pandemic preparedness and, and partly how we prepare society in your view about uncertainties and unknowns and also how pandemic preparedness has impacted on, on health and, and science investments So really looking at it from the other, other perspective around preparing for pandemics. Well, I think this goes right to the heart of the question of vaccines, because right now, uh, I'm sure many panelists have already mentioned this, but the concern, of course, is, you know, when these vaccines come online, will there be a substantial part of the population that uh, is hesitant or outright refuses to take them? And there's been some shocking polling on that. Um, the problem with uncertainties is people don't like them. Um, you know, a lot of people are uncomfortable with, you know, the fact that everything might be contingent and subject to the, you know, the whims of nature. I mean, that's the mystery of a pandemic. Um, you know, it may be essentially unfathomable. That we, we are never gonna answer all the questions about, you know, why a pandemic now and you know not last year or not next year um, so i think the first thing is people have to get learn to live with uncertainty um, and i think the positive thing i take from this whole experience we've been through is been a great opportunity to educate the public uh, in science and in public health in particular uh, but i think that uh, still people need more education on the public health side that's that's the bit i think has rather been neglected I don't think the government listened. I don't think there were enough public health experts sitting on those panels at the Sage and Nerve Tag. Uh, and I think if you look around the world, Southeast Asia certainly, but the governments have done well, even Greece, were where the politicians actually said, you're the public health experts, I want you to take charge of the response. Um, and if you think about it, that's a smart strategy for a politician because they say, you know, I'm handing over to the experts. <laughs> Anything goes wrong, it's on their watch, not my watch. So certainly the countries who managed it best seem to adopt the precautionary principle fairly quickly, saying, you know, in the absence of the evidence, we have to treat this as a serious threat. Do you think that's the lesson, overriding lesson from this? I'm really glad you brought that up because um, one of the things that really confused me at the beginning of this pandemic is, you know, so we're very, you know, think about air traffic control. We spend millions, billions on air traffic control because we're very averse to planes full of people falling out of the sky. It's a rare event, it doesn't happen often, but we may take, go to huge efforts to prevent it. That for me is the precautionary principle, but um, I've had conversations with sociologists who sat on nerve tag who are saying, no, no, you're misunderstanding the precautionary principle. It's more like this idea of equipoise. We, unless we have good evidence to change our position, then we don't assume the worst. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, why not? Let's assume the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, what's the worst that can happen? It might not happen, but at least if you assume the worst, you're prepared that you might be able to resp respond. And I didn't see that happening. And finally, uh, you're obviously a lecturer in the senior lecturer in journalism. How, we're talking a little bit about the media response, but generally yeah. your colleagues in journalism, how do you think they've handled explaining the pandemic? Because clearly that is also crucial how we get information to the public. What, what mark out of 10 would you give journalists in the UK for the way that they've explained it? Well, I, th I think like anything in journalism, there's a wide spectrum. I think we've seen some really, really excellent journalism and you know some below par journalism. Um, I don't want to name any particular names, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is this has been a great opportunity, uh, not just for journalists who, so we expect health and science journalists to get it right. Um, but I suppose, in, I suppose to be honest, in the initial weeks and months of the pandemic, um, because I've written this book, I got quite a lot of calls to go into studios. And I was quite shocked by, um, the levels of scientific illiteracy among well-known BBC presenters. Um, but I think this really reflects, you know, it goes back to C.P. Snow. We still have this two cultures divide in this country where you, you know, uh, you go to university, you take a humanities track or a sciences track. And then after that, the, never the, shall the twain meet again sort of thing. Um, 
So I had people coming out with, you know, uh, soi disant views, uh, which were clearly, you know, reflected middle class established opinion. Oh, it's just like swine flu. We all heard the hype about swine flu. I had to say, no, this is different. Look what happened in Italy. This is the wake up call. Get real, you know. Thank you, Mark, for taking the time to join us. And once again, I'd strongly recommend The Pandemic Century as a, a fabulous uh, reflective book to lead. Thank you for taking the time to Thank join you. us. Hope you Thank can you. Uh, pop Thank in a bit you. later. Uh, thanks again, Mark Honingbone. Uh, 